Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when the nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we follow up on the links and sinkholes at Boone Dam in northern Tennessee, on a river that provides cooling water to seven different nuclear facilities. Imminent danger or not a threat? Stay tuned. Then we're delighted to share with you information on Physicians for Social Responsibility's Nuke Busters Film Competition. Want to earn $5,000 making a really short anti-nuclear film? We'll tell you how. Those interviews, plus our ever-popular numbnuts of the week, activist shout-outs, and more nuclear information than any public school in America is willing to teach. All of it coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, May 5th, 2015, and here is the week's anti-nuclear news. Starting out internationally, where Ukraine said on Saturday, May 2nd, that firefighters have finally extinguished the forest fire that had burned for four days near the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, scene of the world's second-worst nuclear accident in 1986. The blaze came to within 20 kilometers, 12 miles of Chernobyl, after breaking out on Tuesday afternoon, April 28th. Ironically, just two days after Ukraine and the rest of us marked 29 years since the Chernobyl nuclear accident began. According to research, Chernobyl's nuclear threat has returned through these forest fires, which caused radioactive particles to be released over Europe as part of the smoke. Scientists from the Norwegian Institute for Air Research measured radiation levels in the soil and atmosphere and discovered that these fires cause around 0.5 petabecquerels of radioactive cesium to be released over Eastern Europe as smoke. Scientists also warned that the situation could get worse as climate change made these fires more common. Of course, Officials in Ukraine stated that there was no increase in radiation from the fires, but according to nuclear hot seat sources in Europe, a large amount of data is missing because Russia and other surrounding countries switched off their monitoring, at least as far as the public was concerned. But radioactive ash and dust were expected to fall in Kiev, radioactive precipitation fell in Belarus, and people in Honiki, 50 kilometers north of Chernobyl, were shutting themselves indoors inside their homes because outside they could smell the smoke of the fire. And the danger does not pass with the fire being put out. According to Dmitry Bazyaka, the director of the Ukrainian Institute of Radiology, the fire in the Chernobyl forest can harm rain crops. In case radioactive fallout falls on crop fields, there is a high threat of contamination of the soil within a radius of 120 kilometers from the seat of the fire. So even after 29 years, the danger from Chernobyl persists and will continue to do so for tens of thousands of years. At the United Nations, while representatives of the world's nations met to consider the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference, global activists presented 8 million petitions to the United Nations Disarmament Chief on Sunday, demanding a world free of nuclear weapons. There are more than 16,000 active nuclear weapons in the world, any one of which would be a disaster to people and the environment should it be deployed. Of the world's nuclear countries, the United States, Russia, Britain, France, and China have signed on to the NPT, while India, Pakistan, Israel, and North Korea have not. Diplomats from 159 countries support the ban. Japan is engaged in a battle with the rest of the world, and let's call it what it is. Yes, John Belushi from Animal House, Food Fight. In Taiwan, on the heels of a food import customs broker being arrested on charges of faked import testing and documents, which allowed banned food from Chiba Prefecture in Japan into that country, 
Japan sent a delegation of 10 lawmakers, including former Prime Minister Yoshihide Noda, to review Taiwan's policy on restricting imports of Japanese food items suspected of radioactive contamination in the aftermath of the Fukushima nuclear disaster. The new measures, requested by the legislature, require that the specific place of origin, rather than just the country of origin, be listed on Japanese food products. And for some, a radiation inspection certificate will also be required. How sane. In a truly numbnuts exchange, Nobuo Kishi, the leader of the Japanese group, was quoted as telling Kuomintang chairman Eric Chu that he can understand why the government of the Republic of China is taking safety as a top priority, just as the Japanese government will be doing the same if their roles were reversed. You mean you don't think they are? But Kishi said imposing these restrictions in mid-May seemed to be in too much of a hurry and called for more time for both countries to find a way that's acceptable to both sides. No, dude. It's bad. They're doing the right thing. You should be making food safety a top priority in Japan. And in Hong Kong, it has just been discovered that food imported into that country by the sea does not go through routine checks at the dock to test for radiation because the Food and Environmental Hygiene Department has no food inspection checkpoint at the terminal. Food imported by air, however, is tested for radiation at the airport. In January of this year, 10 boxes of Japanese carrots from Chiba, one of the five prefectures from which imports of vegetables and fruits have been banned since the Fukushima accident began, entered the city by the sea. Bet Hong Kong's going to get their own delegation of 10 Japanese legislators real soon. Speaking of Japan, Tokyo Electric Power Company, TEPCO, has finally admitted that the nuclear plant has sprung another leak. Radioactive water has leaked from a storage tank with 70 microsieverts per hour of beta-ray emitting radioactivity detected, far exceeding the recommended maximum dosage of 0.11 microsieverts per hour. The International Atomic Energy Agency, or IAEA, has delayed a report about the meltdowns at Fukushima to give Japanese officials another chance to explain radiation leaking into the Pacific Ocean. The IAEA's report is supposed to be about long-term plans to, quote-unquote, decommission the reactors, but you cannot decommission a nuclear wreckage. You can only decommission an intact reactor, which definitely does not exist at Fukushima Daiichi. Monitors from the IAEA made an unscheduled return trip to Japan in April to follow up on a spike in radiation levels caused by contaminated water leaking into the Pacific. While TEPCO had known about the leaks for months, they didn't discuss them with the agency and say that TEPCO has no obligation to report to the IAEA. However, TEPCO subsequently decided to revise the communications policies and disclose more radiation data. Not that it makes any difference, because they just can't seem to do anything about it. TEPCO's attempt to find out exactly what's going on within the nuclear reactor have been thwarted as the first robot that they sent inside the vessel on April 10 stopped working after advancing just 10 meters because of radiation damage. The second robot they sent in to retrieve the first robot had a camera malfunction due to radiation exposure. So the utility decided to abandon both robot probes. And they still don't know exactly what's going on inside because no one and nothing can get close enough because it's so deadly. Professor Hiroaki Kuide, retired from Kyoto University Research Reactor Institute, says TEPCO believes that there are lumps of melted fuel and they have this idea that they are somehow going to pluck out all of these lumps. They're saying that the first steps they will take is to somehow plug the holes in the containment vessel. I believe this plan that has been presented is simply impossible to realize. We don't even have the technology or ability now even to determine where the holes are. How can we possibly repair them? It's an impossible proposition. 
Kowide goes on to say that the only possible way to deal with the accident is to do what was done at Chernobyl, which is create a concrete coffin or sarcophagus for the facility. In an article in Asahi Shimbun, Yawiman Sato, the ninth generation chief of a sake brewery operating since 1790 and president of electric power company Aizu Denryoku, likened Fukushima's crippled reactors as cauldrons of hell and said, you will be sent to hell and will be boiled in that cauldron if you do evil. And there are four such cauldrons in Fukushima and the disaster has yet to end. It continues to recur every day. University of South Carolina biologist Tim Mousseau and his colleagues reports that the birds of Fukushima are dying. Many species were found to have diminished in number as a result of the accident, and despite the decline in background radiation in the area over these past four years, the deleterious effects of the accident on birds are actually increasing, and according to Mousseau, the worst may not be over. So, in light of all of this news about Fukushima, have you made your reservations for the 2020 Radioactive Tokyo Olympics yet? Early bird specials! Meanwhile, a report in Mainichi says that Japan will see 982,100 people newly diagnosed with cancer in 2015, which is up by 100,000 compared to last year. This according to a projection released by the National Cancer Center on April 28th. Now dig it. The spike is attributed to further progress in aging and the improved accuracy of cancer registration. No one is willing to say the F word, Fukushima. And if that's not delusional enough for you, Asahi ran an article headlined, Nuclear Energy Cheapest Power Source Due to Reduced Disaster Risks. But wait, there's more. The government's new estimates were based on the assumption that the probability of a major nuclear disaster occurring has been reduced following the introduction of new safety screening standards, meaning that the costs of dealing with such accidents would be spread out. You've got new safety screening standards because of the ongoing disaster, nuclear disaster, you've got going on your northeastern coast. Ah, bag Japan. Let's go over to the U.S., where we've got plenty of numbnutsery of our own. Some $73 million will be spent on, quote, mutually beneficial and critical projects, end quote, in New Mexico, by the U.S. Department of Energy and its contractors under an agreement reached with the New Mexico Environmental Department, NMED. The investments will be in lieu of proposed fines for two accidents at the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, or WIP site, in Carlsbad, both of which happened in February of 2014. The second of these, which took place on Valentine's Day, released plutonium and americium into the environment around Carlsbad and resulted in the proven internal contamination of 22 workers with radiologic substances. Now, in December, NMED issued the DOE with fines totaling more than $54 million for violations at both WIP and the Los Alamos National Laboratory. Instead, DOE will spend around $73 million on projects that will result in safer roads, improved water structure, and enhanced emergency responses in New Mexico. Sounds good, doesn't it? Wait for it. The agreement calls for the DOE to provide $34 million to fund necessary repairs to roads in southeastern New Mexico. Remember that location, southeastern New Mexico, used for the transportation of transuranic waste to WIP. It will also provide up to $12 million of improvements to transportation routes in and around Los Alamos and $10 million to upgrade critical water infrastructure in and around Los Alamos, as well as $9.5 million to build engineering structures and improve monitoring around the lab. So instead of a ding and a slap on the hand, they're merely providing infrastructure to support their own work. Governor of New Mexico, Susana Martinez, said, 
The funds we will receive through the agreement will be used to continue ensuring the safety and success of these important facilities, the people who work there, and their local communities. And then Governor Martinez turned around and told the nuclear industry, I'd like some more, please. Which leads us to... Nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, none that sound awake. Governor Martinez of New Mexico is now throwing her weight behind the idea of increasing nuclear waste storage in southeastern New Mexico. Ring a bell? That's why the fine turned into infrastructure support. And let's not waste that new infrastructure, so let's build a whole new way to store nuke waste in southeastern New Mexico. Mm -mm -mm. In a letter that was obtained by the Santa Fe New Mexican, the governor told the U.S. Secretary of Energy, Ernest Moniz, that she supports the creation of an interim nuclear waste storage facility for spent nuclear fuel rods from power plants. Martinez wrote that communities in southeastern New Mexico could broaden their economic base with more nuclear industry work. So could cancer clinics, but that's in the future. Don Hancock of Southwest Research and Information Service in Albuquerque, and one of our reliable sources on all things WIP for nuclear hot seat, said there are two functional problems with this idea. First is that nuclear fuel rods would have to be transported thousands of miles across the United States. He explained, so not only in New Mexico, but people in a lot of other states would be affected by the transportation, which would be extremely dangerous. The second problem, Hancock said, is that interim storage would likely become permanent storage because there is no other existing permanent storage site in the United States or really anywhere else. So the question for Governor Martinez is, who, oh, who, who is contributing to your reelection campaign, eh? I wonder. And that's why you, Governor Susana Martinez of New Mexico, is this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out of week. Making this story even worse is the fact that the company behind it is Holtec International known very well in Southern California as the manufacturers of the thin dry casks, the tin can canisters, favored by Southern California Edison to store the waste from San Onofre. Canisters so flimsy and ill-designed that they are only expected to function within design standards for 20 to 30 years at best, that's by the NRC, And activists have discovered compromises in Holtec canisters up north at Diablo Canyon Nuclear Power Station after only two years. Still, according to Holtec, the facility that they want to build would be able to store, quote, the entire design capacity of the Yucca Mountain Repository, and they anticipate the facility could be brought online in as little as four to five years. Quite frankly... I wouldn't buy a used car from these people. We'll have our featured interviews in just a moment, but first, yes, I glow in the dark. One mile from Three Mile Island to Fukushima and beyond is the story of what it means to be one mile from a leaking nuclear reactor as that accident is happening. In case you haven't guessed, it's my story, and I'm sticking to it. It is available as an ebook on Amazon Kindle, And I think you will enjoy the read. Recently, there have been some alarming online posts about leaks and sinkholes at the Boom Dam in northern Tennessee. The concern is because this dam is upstream from seven different nuclear facilities, all of which rely on these waters for their cooling. Head for the hills! The dam's busting! is a frightening thought that raises visions of a Fukushima-style loss of cooling accident and destruction of backup generators that could possibly lead to one, if not more, meltdowns. The president and CEO of the Tennessee Valley Authority said today a plan to fix Boone Dam could be made public as soon as late July. For the first time, the head of the nation's largest public utility came to the Tri-Cities to visit the dam and talk about the underground problem impacting thousands of people. 
You can see here the sinkhole in the parking lot is flanked by top staff and TVA security. The president and CEO of TVA came to Boone Dam Tuesday to see it for himself. The 60 year old structure he said is now the agency's top priority. Where a sinkhole in a parking lot last year. Has that sunk further than the original? You can see a hole on it on this end where it's settled a little bit. Followed by sediment seeping downstream led TVA to drastically drop water levels. Now we know to keep people downstream safe. Well, the best solution first is to make sure everybody's safe, right? That's the first thing, and that's why the lake level is where it is. Johnson told me TVA is still in the discovery phase, with plans soon to inject grout into the earthen dam, and with hopes that will stop the flow of water at the base of the earth dam. He says TVA still plans to keep water levels low for 2015. As for the future, I think speculating today about what happens in the future with the, the amount of knowledge we have, I just don't think that would be worthwhile doing. So a couple months, I might have a better answer. Around late July, he says, until then, a promise. We're going to do this. We're going to do it right. And whatever it takes, that's what we're going to do. My belief is that not only can we fix it, we will fix it. Again, Johnson saying you're ho he's hoping to unveil that long-term plan for Boone Dam in late July. He said TVA is looking at ways to help business owners impacted by the low lake levels, but exactly how, he said, was not yet known. Meanwhile, marina and boat dock owners doing all they can to keep their businesses afloat will see some relief in the form of a property tax break. Washington and Sullivan counties will offer property tax adjustments to business owners who depend on Boone Lake for their income. Residential property owners can also apply for a property tax adjustment. They must go before the County Board of Equalization, which meets once a year on the first Monday in June. With water levels at Boone Lake at an all-time low, it means access is limited to emergency responders. Sullivan County EMA Director Jim Bean says Pickens Bridge Road boat ramp rather in Washington County, the only access point for all boats, even emergency boats. He said that they are working to solidify some plans on how to deal with the limited access points. You know, by ground, we may have to, it may be a few miles uh, to the other side of the lake, but uh, so we'll have to approach it from what's the quickest access point based on where they're at. Bean said they've requested aerial photos of the lake to get a better idea of where they can access, get access to emergencies if they need to by foot. A cruise will lower the level of another area lake to stabilize the shoreline. The Bristol, Tennessee Parks and Recreation Department announced today it will install a timber wall along the old beach area at Steel Creek Park to stop erosion. To do that, the city must lower the lake 6 to 10 inches. That project is expected to last three to four weeks, and when it's complete, the city will restore the lake to its normal level. Firefighters are battling two separate brush fires in the area tonight, and we're in your corner gathering information from both scenes. The first near the Butler Bridge, that's Highway 67 and the Highway 321 split. Unclear tonight how many acres have burned there. We do know work is underway to contain that fire. 911 dispatchers said Johnson County firefighters are on the scene of another brush fire. So the question is, how likely is this to happen? To find out, I spoke with upwards of half a dozen people, most of them activists, to get their input, including Lou Zeller, executive director of Breedle, the Blue Ridge Environmental Defense League. He had no definitive answer, but filled us in on the geographic placement of Boone Dam and the reasons for concern. Boone Dam is in the eastern part of Tennessee, close to the Tri-Cities area, Johnson City, Bristol, and Kingsport. It is on the Holston River, the south fork of the Holston River. And of course, the Holston River, along with the French Broad River, are the headwaters of the Tennessee River. And they join just outside of Knoxville, Tennessee. So the concern that I would have would be the stress that a break at the Boone Dam could place on downstream reservoirs. And if you go downstream, from the Boone Dam in the Tri-Cities area down towards Knoxville, you come to the Cherokee Reservoir, and then below that, of course, there is the Watts Bar Reservoir near Chattanooga, and then you've got the reservoir that serves uh, the Sequoia Nuclear Power Station there. Those are both operating nuclear plants, Sequoia and also Watts Bar. So the concern would be that I would have is that you put stress on one or more of those dams, 
and I, you know, I can't speak to the conditions of every one of those reservoirs, but that would be the first thing that I would want to find out about if the consequences of the sinkholes and, and whatnot are damaging the dam and causing a problem downstream. So there is a chance that with these other intervening dams downstream of Boom Dam, that there might be a safety with the downstream dams, but on the other hand, there might be a cascading effect and a surge of water from one failed dam could put too much stress on the others and they could go as well. A cascading effect would be a very good way to describe that, Libby, and I know that there are people who are concerned, and we have been concerned as well, about the reservoir which serves the Sequoia Nuclear Power Station, we know that there are problems there. Lou Zeller of the Blue Ridge Environmental Defense League. After checking out the information with multiple activists, I contacted a senior vice president in the Tennessee Valley Authority, or TVA, and he put me in touch with Jim Hobson, TVA's manager of public relations. I don't usually like talking with PR flax, but Hobson also has creds as having worked at both Watts Bar and Sequoia Nuclear Power Facilities, both of them down the river from Boone Dam, though I neglected to ask him what his positions were there. Here's what Hobson had to say. Jim, what is, from your perspective, the current situation at Boone Dam? At Boone Dam, we have been monitoring some unexplained seepage that is coming from an earthen embankment that abuts up against the concrete portion of the dam. Uh, at this point, all indications are that that earthen embankment is completely sound. However, just like if you have a leak in a basement at your home, any time that you've got water coming around a foundation, you need to be concerned about that. And so obviously TVA is concerned. We are currently investigating the cause of that seepage and will then uh, establish the necessary fixes. I understand that there was recently a sinkhole, I believe, in a parking lot close by. What does that indicate about what is happening with the water from the dam? In the area around Boone Dam in the northeastern part of Tennessee, you have a particular type of geology called karst geology. Uh, what that means is that uh, some of the strata of ground, essentially, some of the, the, the rock strata is made of limestone. And you have situations where a water, uh, natural groundwater, will erode that limestone after a period of time and you end up with cavities. Those cavities will occasionally collapse and create sinkholes. Sinkholes by themselves are not a serious concern as they can be filled. Uh, however, there is this seepage issue that is a concern because that means that there is actively water coming from somewhere under that earthen embankment, and that's what we're concerned about and what we're fixing. Since the Fukushima accident began over four years ago, there has been increased awareness by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and more force put behind the need to be vigilant about situations such as the STAM because it is upriver from seven different nuclear facilities, including Watts Bar, Sequoia, Browns Ferry, and the, and the site at Bellafont. What has had to be done to hand into the NRC? Well, the NRC, of course, has been uh, aware of the situation since we initially discovered it. However, the Boone Dam system is significantly upstream from the first of those nuclear facilities, which is Watts Bar. In fact, there are four dams, three very large reservoirs between Boone Dam and the Watts Bar nuclear plant along the Tennessee River system. So even if the unlikely event of an issue at Boone Dam were to materialize, there is more than sufficient capacity for the entire contents of Boone Reservoir in any of those downstream reservoirs. I've spoken with a number of activists in connection with this story, and they have expressed concerns that are pre-existing dealing with some of those dams. Specifically, Sequoia was mentioned, the question being, what would happen if there was a failure of some sort at Boone Dam 
and it ended up with a water surge hitting those dams. What is the possibility for additional failures or possibly cascading failures? The immediate downstream dam from Boone, which is Fort Payne Dam, uh, is a fairly small dam and uh, would not be able to stop any water that would come down from Boone Reservoir if the entire reservoir were to come downstream. However, the next reservoir, Cherokee Reservoir, is of substantial size. In fact, it is the second largest reservoir in the TVA system, and it has more than sufficient quantity to be able to absorb all of the water in the Boone Reservoir if that were to occur. Uh, assuming that we had a problem at Cherokee, you have the Fort Loudoun Reservoir, then you have Watts Bar Reservoir, both very large mainstream reservoirs. So. The odds of even if the uh, worst case scenario would happen at Boone, the odds of that water being able to make it to even the first of the nuclear plants uh, in TVA system is extraordinarily remote. What is the distance we're talking about here between Boone Dam and, say, the Fort Payne Dam and beyond that to Wattsbar? Fort Payne would be a very small distance, about five river miles, from Boone Dam to uh, Watts Bar Nuclear Plant in river miles would be well over 100 river miles. With the NRC, what are they looking for and how reassured have they been by the information that you have provided? Well, I can't speak for the NRC in terms of what they are uh, feeling at this point. Obviously, we have been in very open and honest communication with the NRC, both at the uh, resident level at the plants as well as with the Region 2 office in Atlanta. They are very familiar with the situation at Boone as well as all of the steps that TVA and other nuclear utilities have uh, implemented to ensure that a beyond design basis event such as Fukushima does not create a significant problem for U.S. nuclear plants. The concern expressed by activists who are distant from the site, you may be aware that there have been a number of alarming articles or alarming excerpts from articles that have been appearing online that have pointed to this being an imminent disaster. The concerns that have been raised are about not only flooding of the facilities themselves, which of course the nuclear reactors would be shut down, but also the flooding of any spent fuel pools and the flooding of the backup systems that would be used to cool the remaining fuel that was there. How likely is that to take place? It is not likely to take place. You're dealing with a situation that in technical terms is called probable maximum flood. Uh, probable maximum flood is the maximum hydrologic situation that any one point could expect to uh, achieve. In the history of the Tennessee Valley and the history of the Tennessee River, that probable maximum flood level has never occurred. But assuming that it does occur, Watts Bar, which is the closest nuclear site to this particular dam, not only has uh, facilities that are above that probable maximum flood level, including the emergency diesel generators at that particular facility, but the spent fuel pool is located above probable maximum flood level, and Watts Bar is the first nuclear site in the country to implement the new flex strategies to add an additional layer of emergency power and water supplies both of which are located above that probable maximum flood level. That combination of elements gives us high assurance that uh, we would not be considered a, 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 an emergency situation even if a dam immediately upstream from Watts Bar were to uh, mysteriously give away or mysteriously vanish. What steps are being taken now to fix the problem at Boone Dam, or are you still in the diagnostic phase? We are still in the investigation phase at this point. We are uh, still conducting uh, both seismic issues as well as uh, core sample uh, samples there on that earthen embankment, trying to get a better idea of exactly where this seepage could be uh, coming from. Uh, once that information is gathered, is analyzed not only by TVA personnel, but by industry-leading personnel from across the United States, some of whom 
who have dealt with similar issues at other dams uh, around the country. Uh, we will then be in a better position to determine what the uh, final fix for the issue will be, and we will immediately implement that, uh, that fix. Here's the thing. Are we concerned about Moon Dam? Absolutely, which is why we're spending so much time and effort to find out what's going on. Are we concerned about Boone Dam as it pertains to our nuclear plants? Not really. Not only because it is so significantly upstream and we have so much downstream reservoir capability to store anything there, but frankly, we do not think there is an imminent danger with Boone. We're simply fixing a problem before it becomes worse. Jim Hobson of the Tennessee Valley Authority. As I said at the start, I'm usually skeptical of the official line that comes from PR reps. But in my conversations with the activists who sit on community boards dealing with nuclear issues and the Boone Dam problem in particular, they echoed what Hobson said. These are not naive people, and they all come to the issue with their own set of information. So my take on it is that this is one situation where we can stand down from the front-running edge of panic. There is a problem at the dam. Nukes are filled with problems of their own. But for now, according to the best sources I could find, we are not in any imminent danger. May that continue to be so, and we will keep you posted. On a happier note, Physicians for Social Responsibility has just launched a short film competition with some serious money and visibility for the winners. To find out more, I spoke with two spokespeople intimately involved with this competition, Christine Herman and Martin Fleck of PSR's Washington, D.C. main office. Christine Herman and Martin Fleck, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you. Thanks. It's great to be on. First of all, let's get a sense of who you are and your positions at Physicians for Social Responsibility. Christine, would you start us off? Well, I came to Physicians about a year and a half ago to run the philanthropy office. And my interest is in making sure Physicians is well-grounded, has the funding to do what it needs to do. One of the issues is abolishing nuclear weapons. That's a cause near to my heart as well as... Uh, climate change and toxics in the environment. I have a film background, though, which is why you're talking to me today. And Mark? I'm the security program director at Physicians for Social Responsibility. I've been doing that since 2013. But prior to that, for 16 years, I was the executive director of the Washington State Chapter of PSR. And um, I love working for activist doctors who are addressing the gravest threats to human health and we certainly feel that nuclear weapons, it's time to put them in the dustbin of history. It's a threat that we can live without. What motivated PSR to create the Nuke Busters film competition? There's a sense uh, that the nuclear weapons issue and the nuclear arms race issues were very, you know, people were concerned about them in the 50s. They were concerned about them when the Cuban Missile Crisis happened in the early 60s. They were concerned about these issues in the early 1980s. But since then, the interest has waned, and we have an entire new generation of people uh, who don't really actually know very much about this threat and, and might be surprised to hear that there's still over 15,000 nuclear weapons. And we're very interested in reaching young folk uh, and letting them know that the situation is out there and needs to be addressed. What we find is that young people communicate a little bit differently than the elders do. They are very much online and visual, and we're looking for a way to reach them. And short film, a film of one to four minutes, is an ideal method for reaching people and getting them where they live. So we're hoping to interest young filmmakers into creating some piece of art that will speak to their peers and film just happens to be this perfect medium because it's forwardable, it's postable, and who knows what can happen with it. It can, it can really make a difference. What focus or what are you hoping to achieve with the films that will be created for the competition? Well, one of the things we want young filmmakers to do is to start thinking about this 
in terms of an issue that that is so enormous that get a handle around some part of it. It may be the faith part of it. It may be just the economic argument because we spend so much budget-wise on nuclear weapons when we can't ever use them. You know, we, we'd like filmmakers to start getting a handle on some part of this that makes just grabs their interest and maybe helps them grow individually and then gather the people up around them, the people who are helping them make the film, maybe their parents, maybe their friends who are appearing in it or editing it or doing any kind of help with supporting them. They start gathering people into their little sphere of influence and then when they post it, we're going to get a whole nother crowd who will vote on it. So it's one of these kind of things where we're hoping to sort of inspire interest as an issue. And what I hear from people, artists, you get an interest in a topic and it sort of nags at you and you have to work on it. And it's something that frequently comes back to you again and again in another way. So we're hoping to inspire young filmmakers to take on this issue and to really run with it throughout their life. You know, my sense is that... Um the young people that I talk to are very interested in reshaping the world to the way that they should, they think it should be. Uh, and you see actually a lot of activism among young folks. And we figured that the best communicators to the millennials would be themselves, that young people themselves creating a film may very well be the best way to uh, come up with something that would be compelling. You know, young people, they're very interested in changing the world for the better. And, and the message here is something along the lines of, hey, we're trying to change the world. Get out of the way. Boy, I can remember when we were saying that way back a number of decades ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so given that these millennials probably don't have the benefit of a lot of background on nuclear weapons, the kind of information you want to see put across in the faith argument, the medical argument, and the economic argument. What kind of research help or guidelines or roadmap are you giving them so that they have access to the kind of information you'd like to see incorporated in these films? We figured that our website is probably the best place and the most likely place for young filmmakers to go. We have a specific nuclear weapons section of the website, and there's a specific resources page there. And we've got a millennial on staff who's keeping, uh, making sure that those, that resources page is, is kept up to date. There's no shortage of information. The trick is getting that information into the hands of the filmmakers. We have the ability to do a webinar if there's an in interest from filmmakers, we can have people, um, they call in or if they write to us saying that they'd be interested in that, we were happy to have a webinar. You have narrowed the focus to nuclear weapons. Will there be consideration of films if they happen to deal with nuclear power issues or uranium mining issues, for example? For this right now, I think we have to stick to how we've described it in the contest rules. Um, because there's very specific rules. We couldn't really add those to this. We could feasibly, if something mentions uranium mining, for instance, we certainly wouldn't object to that. I mean, we're concerned about radiation and health. Did you want to say something add to that, Mark? Yeah, just to the degree, the danger is of these nuclear weapons being detonated. That's really the danger that we're looking to educate about. Of course, these things are related you know, nuclear materials and mining and all that is related. So to the degree it's related, sure. But what we're trying to do is prevent any more cities destroyed by nuclear weapons. And I think also, Libby, we're really interested in making people aware of the Humanitarian Impacts Initiative. Um, Martin, do you want to say a few words about that? The Humanitarian Impact Initiative is the big exciting thing that's happening right now in the world of disarmament. The countries that have nuclear weapons, and there's nine of them, they're obligated to pursue disarmament negotiations by the Non-Proliferation Treaty. It's been 45 years since that treaty went into effect. Clearly, the nuclear weapon states aren't living up to their obligations. So a new movement has started, and that's the Humanitarian Impact of Nuclear Weapons Initiative. And it's being driven both by civil society, which means PSR and our international organization, International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, and many other organizations, and 
by uh, national governments of nations that don't have nuclear weapons and really do want to see progress on disarmament. There have been three conferences since the last review conference of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. There was a conference in 2013 that was hosted by Norway, and 127 nations sent official government delegations to that. There was another conference in February of 2014. It was sponsored by Mexico, and 146 governments sent delegations to that. And then the last one was just this last December in Vienna, the third conference. 158 nations attended. That's over 80% of the nations of the world. Four of the nuclear weapons states also attended India, Pakistan, the United States, and Great Britain. This is an analysis of the the impact of nuclear weapons and getting away from these discussions about the security value of nuclear weapons. And uh, it's really a key element on the path towards getting rid of them altogether, is to realize that the humanitarian impacts of these weapons are unacceptable, and therefore it would be appropriate to ban them, as we have done with chemical and biological weapons powerful work and certainly an inspiration for any filmmaker who wants their work to be making a difference in the world. Now, in putting this competition together, you have some significant financial prizes that are available and also visibility. Why don't you talk about what the participants will receive and what the winners will receive as a result of their involvement? What we ask people to do is enter their short film, and there's an early bird deadline if people so choose to use it in early July, so that we'll look at the early films and we'll tell the filmmaker, yes, this meets our regulations, it's on length, and it speaks to the issue that we've set out to have these films reach. So once those films pass that bar, whether they're coming in in early July or July 31st, we'll post them online. And then that will give the public, and including everybody this filmmaker and any filmmaker knows, all of our membership, anybody from the public can vote and select their favorite film. So what we'll do is allow three weeks for a public voting period. So a filmmaker really wants to have his or her film viewed. So that's the first win, is having your film recognized as being an entry in this contest. And then we'll choose about 10 finalists. And from those finalists, we're looking at having those five prizes, as we mentioned, one $5,000 prize for the best short film by a student filmmaker and a $5,000 prize for a non-student filmmaker, somebody who's been out of school more than a year. Maybe a semi-pro, maybe a teacher, maybe making films for uh, a company. But we're looking for people who are young in their career, but, you know, there's no age stipulation whatsoever. And another $5,000 prize will go to that person. And then we gave three prizes for the best short film to articulate, A, the economic argument, the budget that we're spending on this, and it'll be about a trillion dollars in the next 30 years. Um, It's just way too much for some weaponry that is suicidal. The second prize is the health argument, the best short film to articulate the health argument. And then the third one will be for the best short film to articulate the faith-based argument. So we expect to have a panel of celebrities, and we have invitations out to five individuals who I can't name because they haven't yet said yay or nay, but there are people that... Everybody knows their names. So those people will do the deciding work. Then the winners will be announced around the time of our World Summit of PSR members. It's going to be around the 19th or 20th of September when we expect to have an event at one of the local embassies here. And we'd like to be able to show all the winning films. And then later in the year... And we don't have an exact date yet, but we're looking at doing something with the World Summit of um, Nobel Peace Laureates. And the Nobel Committee is sort of talking about what they're going to be doing and where and when. And so we're, we're still working out the details on how that will work. But our, our hope is that we'll be able to have something to show students. They were talking about doing something with many students being invited to. So our hope is to be having a really grand 
uh, not a festival, but just a, a showing of all the winners to uh, many thousands of students. The summit of Nobel Peace Laureates have been strong supporters of the Humanitarian Impact Initiative, uh, along with the International Red Cross. And so it's, it's great to have backing like that for the work that we're doing. What, if any, collaboration have you explored with the Uranium Film Festival, which just completed its most recent manifestation in Quebec two weeks ago? I wasn't aware of it. Um, to tell you the truth, I um, we we have um, been aware of some other film festivals going on, and Teresa is uh, who I think you had an interchange with. Um, has been sending out info to the San Francisco Film Festival and, and Sundance, of course, we're interested in. Um, you asked earlier how we were promoting it, and we're starting with students because we're really interested in getting them before the end of the term. And the, the terms are ending right now, and so we're really, we've really been pushing for in April to get students first. And now we're going to be working on spreading the the word to professional filmmakers. So the Uranium Film Festival crew may be good people to reach out to. I think they would be excellent because certainly they would be attuned and they might provide you with another platform to at least show the winning films or the films beyond the winning films that are of note at their next festival whenever and wherever it takes place. We're really happy to do that. In fact, our intention was to link up with film festivals at a later date. So I take it the competition just started and you're just beginning to promote it. Have you gotten any responses yet? I've been going around to several events. I was at the Peace and Planet, um, which was a big peace march and rally in New York prior to the beginning of the NPT review. I was out in Tucson speaking in April. I was up in Maryland speaking just uh, this last Saturday. And when I, I've been handing out this Nukebusters material and asking people if they know folks, young folks who might make a film, it seems like almost everyone that I hand these to says yes. They can think of someone, either a relative or a colleague or a friend or son or daughter of a friend who is interested in this. So there's some anecdotal spot polling that I've been doing and getting pretty good response. <laughs> is this a one-shot competition, or might it be done on a more regular basis, such as annually? Well, we've got to see how it turns out. Is this coming from special funding that you have received, or is this out of the operational costs of PSR? We got special funding just for this from an organization called N Square, and they're a new organization. They call themselves the Crossroads for Nuclear Security Innovation. They're funded by a group of five funders, including Plowshares, and they're just looking for doing things completely differently than what the security field has been used to. What the security community has typically been doing. Yeah, they're, I, I, I think it's safe to say N-Square is really interested in shaking it up a little bit and see if there aren't some new approaches that we can take to get the message out and, and promote disarmament. This is an issue that's been with us for a long time, since 1945. I feel like I'm going to have to say something about the elephant in the room, and that is that everybody who's been working on this issue for so long is graying in hair. And um, we're all getting a little older, and we need young people to take this on. Some issues are multi-generational, like, for instance, abolishing slavery. You know, the, the first people who, to come out against slavery, uh, they didn't necessarily live to see the day when there was no more slavery. But some issues are multi-generational. This apparently is one of them. Well, considering how long the effects of nuclear radiation last, it's not surprising that we're going to have to go through some generations to get ourselves to the end of the line on this one. Amen, sister. <laughs> how can people submit films? Where do they go? What do they need to do? They need to look at psr.org slash nukebusters, N-U-K-E-B-U-S-T-E-R-S, and read our guidelines. They're pretty specific. The film must be one to four minutes in length. 
We don't mind if film footage has been shot prior, but it, the entry should be cut specifically for the contest. It should be in English. And the main entrant should be an American citizen or a, a resident with a tax ID number. Everything somebody needs to know is on our website on that page. And there's a call for entries, and it specifically shows you how to step through the different process for entering. And what a, um appropriate summer to be doing this competition, since this summer will also have the 70th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. This is a great summer to draw attention to these issues. And amen, brother, to that one. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, the judging from the public will start right around the, anniversary, the 70th anniversary of Hiroshima. Well, I'm certainly looking forward to having the chance to see these films. Again, having just come back from Quebec two weeks ago and seen the variety of films that were available from all over the world, I'm very excited about this supporting a new stream of interest that involves young filmmakers in media that they can control and create by themselves. It's a great way to plant the seeds that can grow into greater awareness and hopefully many new generations of activists to come behind those of us whose hair is turning a bit gray. <laughs> <laughs> Christine Herman and Martin Fleck of Physicians for Social Responsibilities, Washington, D.C., main office. To learn more about the Nuke Busters film competition, go to psr.org and click on the video box on the right-hand side so you can go to the Nuke Busters page. $5,000 first prize or $1,000 prize on three separate topics. Mary Beth Brangan and Jim Heddle of Eon 3 and Myla Reason of short videos by Myla Reason? Are you listening? And the rest of you, too. Let's see those films. Nuclear Hot Seat relies on your donations to keep us going and growing. I have tremendous gratitude to those of you who donate when, how often, and as much as you can. Some of you make a single donation, others a small recurring payment. However you do so... You touch my heart, and you help keep me going. So if you find that Nuclear Hot Seat makes you laugh, think, helps you understand the nuclear issues and not be so alone with your awareness, help keep us doing it. Go to NuclearHotSeat.com. On the homepage, just scroll down and click on the big red Donate button. Whatever you can do to help, thank you. Activist shout-outs. Fukushima Fallout Awareness Network's Stop the TPP, No Radioactive Waste in Our Food, now has audio recordings available on their YouTube channel. You can find it via their website, ffan.us. The audios were taken from the Call In to Action event, which took place on April 11th, which culminated nearly three weeks of education and media outreach. Mary Beth Brannion of Eon3, Cindy Folkers of Beyond Nuclear, Adam Weissman and Kimberly Roberson of Fukushima Fallout Awareness Network presented information on the increased threat of radioactivity contaminated food imports under the threat of the classified Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP. Jim Turner Esquire and Chairman of Citizens for Health gave an update on FAN's citizen petition to the FDA and why it's more important than ever that you sign. For those of you who couldn't be on the live call, the event recordings are available and were produced in five parts by Jim Heddle and Mary Beth Brangan. Thank you very much. So please listen, share, and subscribe to the YouTube channel for FAN. And in order to sign the petition, you can find the leak at ffan.us. That's FF like Fukushima Fallout Awareness Network dot US. And Massachusetts Downwinders are sponsoring a four-day march to protest Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station, acknowledged as one of the five worst-run reactors in the U.S., and this according to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's website as of March of 2015. From Saturday, June 13 to Tuesday, June 16 of this year, they will march 54 miles over four days from the Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station in Plymouth to the Boston State House. Join them! Join them!
for part or all of the march, or donate to help. You'll find good company, meals, and accommodations all provided. And all belongings will be towed by van, so you won't have to carry any of your gear. This is sounding like a really good deal. So why don't you check it out? Go to madownwinders.org, that's Massachusetts in the madownwinders.org, slash calendar. Here's today's final thought. I'm all thought out. Who'd have thunk it? I'll have something else to say next week. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, May 5th, 2015. Material for this week's show has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, AFP, Daily News, H-I-S-Z dot R-S-O-E dot H-U, New York Times dot com, Reuters, Al Jazeera dot com, Focus Taiwan dot T-W, S-C-M-P dot com, Nuclear Dash News dot net, Bloomberg dot com, Zero Hedge dot com, Asahi Shimbun, NHK, University of South Carolina, Dr. Timothy Mousseau, CBS News, Chris Harris, Mainichi dot J-P, AtlantaProgressiveNews.com, Santa Fe, New Mexican, the failed journalists at World Nuclear News, and the pre, post, and current millennials in the Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook community, which you are all invited to join and then go make a film for PSR. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV and is also available on AirProgressive.com. Our archive, which is now over 200 episodes large, is available on our website and is also available on iTunes, where you can subscribe under podcasts. And our YouTube channel carries the show under Nuclear Hot Seat videos. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues. So if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2015, Libby, Helene, and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that radiation does not dilute. It just spreads out and continues to be deadly and to bioaccumulate. So all that official talk about, it's such a low dose, it won't hurt you, is just a bunch of propagandistic crap. And we've all had our nuclear wake-up call. So don't go back to sleep, because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat, it's the bomb.